Welcome back to the Energy Intelligence Forum. I'm joined here today by Ahmed Mehdi, Managing Director at Renaissance Energy and also Research Associate at Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Thank you for joining me this morning, Ahmed. Thank you. Um, just to start off, uh, what in your view is the greatest <clears throat> challenge for oil markets at this point? And do you believe that OPEC Plus can roll back its curbs in January as planned? Thank you very much. Um, so there are a few moving parts uh, to the market at the moment. Um, uh, whilst the markets regained around two thirds um, of the volume of demand that was lost in March and April, uh, this, this, this return was really driven by uh, light end demand, so primarily gasoline as lockdowns eased and the summer holidays um, supported a rise in transport. Um, also, one of the other factors that we've seen this year is the central role of China in mopping up the marginal barrel in the market. And uh, there were some concerns around Chinese buying, particularly given that it was largely opportunistic and also primarily driven and also driven by um, improving economic indicators in the country, particularly industrial output. Um, also, obviously, uh, yesterday's panel um, with uh, the UAE Energy Minister, we heard a lot about the historic OPEC Plus deal that's done a great job in curbing output in different phases. Um, however, the fact remains that uh, Brent has been stuck in a very narrow range of 40 to $45 since July. And there are a few bearish uh, factors that are set to complicate OPEC uh, decision making going forward. Uh, so first of all, we've seen uh, the, the crisis hit different parts of the barrel, and in particular, um, uh, we still have uh, middle distillate inventories at a very high level, and jet fuel having been uh, hit significantly. And that's complicated decision-making for refiners who have resorted to blending. And uh, and whilst winter demand will um, will see higher uh, demand for products like kerosene hel helping alleviate some of the terrible margins that refiners are facing, it still cannot be ignored that inventory product uh, product stocks remain elevated. Uh, secondly, um, OPEC traditionally is far more effective in supply, si supply side shocks because it can activate uh, spare production capacity um, or, 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 or remove its markets, uh, sorry, remove its barrels from the market. However, in a demand side shock like COVID, it's far more challenging for OPEC because really the oil demand is just a function of the health of the global economy. And that's very mm. uh, difficult and, and not many people have, a, you know, have the ability to predict where that's moving, particularly given um, the fact that there are so many uncertainties with regards to COVID. Um, so even though there is talk of, of a vaccine, that's not necessarily a silver bullet and so on and so forth. Um, finally, um, op on, on OPEC supply side management, uh, the market is going to be entering a very uh, uh, troubling quarter with regards to the return of Libyan oil production. And whilst we've seen on and off uh, scenarios for Libya for you know in recent um, months, uh, there is suggestions that this could be a more sustainable return of Libyan crude to the market, putting pressure on um, on, on Brent. Uh, in particular, given the fact that the cargoes are moving to uh, the Mediterranean. So um, yesterday's panel with the UAE's energy minister, uh, Sahel Al-Mazroui, he mentioned that um, OPEC will, will proceed with its supply boost um, in January. However, I, I struggle to see how that will happen, um, given the uh, limited headroom for the market in, in the first quarter of next year. So most likely, in my opinion, we'd likely see a delay by several months uh, by OPEC, and that will be really driven by um, some of the issues and ongoing anxieties around uh, supply side issues, but also uh, rising COVID cases. Thank you. And, uh, and, and finally, I wanted to ask, what are the key geopolitical factors that are set to impact oil and energy markets going forward? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the US elections are going to be really fundamental in terms of determining some, uh, some key factors and outcomes. Um, on the US production side, um, I think it's difficult to, uh, to really buy into all of the um, quite doom and gloom analysis around Biden's plans for, if he were to win, for 
um, uh, its impact on the U.S. upstream. Because actually, ironically, I think that despite the anxieties around issues such as um, federal drilling bans, um, uh, we're more likely to see uh, U.S. producers navigate their way around that. For example, moving from offshore to onshore um, exploration and development. Also, uh, I don't think Biden is going to preside over, you know, the return of, you know, a huge return of U.S. oil imports. Um, so I think it will be a more nuanced development, uh, particularly focusing on uh, resurrecting some of the Obama uh, uh, plans, such as Clean Power Plan, and also re-entering the Paris Climate Agreement. However, there are geopolitical outcomes when it comes to central tenants of um, Trump's U.S. energy policy, uh, such as uh, the concept of energy dominance and what does that mean in terms of uh, weaponization of trade tools such as sanctions on Iran, you know, whether or not we're going to see the return of Iranian barrels to the market, what the time frame for that looks like, and also other areas not less discussed such as Russia, where in fact you could get completely unintended outcomes like uh, uh, the likelihood of, uh, the, the higher likelihood of, for example, of a um, uh, uh, of Nord Stream 2 being completed under under Biden versus under Trump because Biden would seek to build alliances with Merkel and, and uh, Angela Merkel, mm. the German chancellor, um, and so extracting concessions from Merkel on a number of issues in return for allowing the completion of Nord Stream 2 could be one of the scenarios. Um, also in the Middle East itself, um, we've seen... Uh, growing anxieties around what the future role of the U.S. will look like in the region. And that's already led to some key diplomatic developments, such as the normalization of relations between Israel and the UAE. But also, we are um, uh, also seeing some other developments with regards to Saudi-U.S. ties as well. Finally, U.S.-China is, is also going to be really quite central. And I don't think that we're going to see any relaxation on the um, on, on that front, I think it's just going to be a reformulation of the relationship where we're more likely to see competition accelerate in key areas like clean energy, AI, um, semiconductors, and also uh, competition over who will control the um, uh, lithium-ion battery to electric vehicle supply chain as well. Um, and very and very finally on China, I think that, you know, we're already seeing some very concerning features which will which will play into next year, like escalating tensions in the South China Seas, um, the China's five-year plan, which is focusing more on energy security and uh, and, and seeking to uh, reduce reliance or, on oil imports and, and gas imports, so, and and focus more on coal and how that actually relates to their clean energy plan. So. There are there, there are quite a few geopolitical factors that will be important. So really, in summary, it's it's going to be uh, reformulating. You know, will there be a reformulation of U.S. energy policy, maybe away from energy dominance towards more competition around climate leadership? Second one is going to be around internal relations in the Middle East, and third. Um, I think that there will be a continuation of the whole uh, U.S.-China um, uh, trade tensions and, 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 and the uh, anxieties around that and its implications for supply chains and energy markets. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your insights, Ahmed, and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much.